Welcome back to the Inspiring Leadership Book Club. This month is a really interesting book. I'm excited to speak with you about it. Uh, it's called Making Numbers Count, The Art and Science of Communicating Numbers. And um, before getting into the book in too much detail, I'd love to share a couple of examples, learning points from the book this way. Which is more impactful? The first way of communicating this statistic, this number, or the second way? Okay, example number one. In terms of economic prowess, California leads all other 49 US states in gross domestic product. If California were a freestanding country, it would be the fifth largest economy in the world. First example. Second example, the chances of something happening is a million to one. And the second way I might explain that is, if you go to the library to where the Harry Potter books are and you remove the second book, so you've got book one, three, four, five, six, and seven looking at you. You, took out one, you take out one of the books, you go to a random page, you circle a random word, and you put the book back in the library. Somebody else comes in behind you, they're looking at those same six books. The chances of them opening to the same book on the same page and circling the same word are a million to one. That's the second example. Third example. Modern humans first appeared 200,000 years ago, a very recent addition to the universe, because the Big Bang occurred an estimated 13.8 billion years ago. That's the raw numbers. Could explain it this way. Suppose the history of the universe spanned the 24 hours of a single day. The Big Bang happens precisely at midnight, the very beginning of the day. For a long time, nothing happens. 12 hours pass, then 16 hours pass, at about 4.10 p.m., our sun comes to life in the midst of a cloud of dust and the planets start forming around it. Five minutes later, the earth appears and begins to cool. Single cell life appears on earth by 5.30 p.m. Vertebrates don't arrive until around 11.09 p.m. of this one day of the earth's history. Dinosaurs and the first mammals appear around 11.37 p.m. T-Rex shows up at 11.52 with eight minutes left in the day, but disappears when an asteroid hits a minute later. The entire history of humankind doesn't even take up the final second. So I love these examples as a way of demonstrating the value of communicating numbers in different ways. From my point of view, the this, this second examples, the second way of communicating these examples is so much more compelling. Whether you're talking about uh, a category jumping thing, like comparing the California economy to a country, or you're talking about, you're translating one in a million to something you can really understand, namely that these depth of the Harry Potter books, because those six books uh, have a million words in them combined, or humankind's history on earth as described through the lens of a single 24 hour day and where does human history fit? You know, doesn't even take up the final second. I think just now I understand what that means as before. So what we're talking about today uh, in, in, in the book club is the book, as I mentioned, Making Numbers Count, uh, The Art and Science of Communicating Numbers. Um, my focus in, in, in reading this book myself and then in sharing this book in this forum is considering how it can help people, particularly people in business, how to be more effective. Um, how can they advocate better? How can they help other people understand the impact of their decisions or even what we're arguing about? Are we talking about the right statistics? Which statistic and statistics and which numbers are most important for us to be discussing? Um, how can we effect, more effectively speak the language of our audience? or audience is, because it could be different from one meeting to the next. So to that extent, I think this book is super practical, tactical, useful. Uh, I, I really enjoy it. It's a, it's a pretty quick read. You could pick it up in the middle and read a particular chapter, look for examples uh, that bring it to life. It's not a long, dense academic thing by any stretch. 
And you can compare this type of a book with some of the other books we've, we've reviewed and we've discussed that are really more about purpose, about what we need to thrive, about what vulnerability means, about, about empathic listening, and uh, even about listening to our own tune within us. So this is much more tactical and really, really engaging and useful. I think it's a really nice balance and it's a nice menu item on our menu of books here in, in, this, uh, in this book club and podcast. Uh, the book's written by Chip Heath and Carla Starr. Uh, Chip Heath is a professor at Stanford uh, School of Business. He and his brother have written a series of best-selling books, including The Power of Moments and Decisive and Made to Stick. And the co-author, Carla Starr, has written for a number of magazines. She's a science writer, an award-winning science writer. And her first book was called Can You Be Lucky? Why Some People Seem to Win More Often Than Others which also was, was a very highly regarded book. So again, uh, for me, I, I, th I think this is about listening for ways to be more effective in our communication. The numbers do not speak for themselves. We need to speak for the numbers and this book helps us do that. So there are some key principles in this book, one of which is to best communicate numbers, don't use them, don't use numbers use metaphors, use comparisons, use, uh, you know, round up, round down, group things together. And I'll give some specific examples of some of these tactics in just a minute. That's largely what this talk is about, those examples. Translate everything into instinctive human experience, something people can relate to. Marketing people understand this uh, better than, than, than I do, for, certainly. And that's why these examples are really helpful because there's examples of what does it mean to translate something into instinctive human experience. And the authors say, if you use math well, you've got a valuable skill, but if you can use it and make it clear, and what that means, it's clear to the audience member. So I'm converting the numbers into something that feels uh, uh, um, more clear, something they can see and something they can feel, not something that's obscure or something that's over their heads. And that's really a superpower, not just a skill. And if we think about how much time and energy is spent gathering, formulating the right numbers, you know, we, the right equation and then the right number and the right result, you know, hallelujah, we've got this number that represents something statistically. How do we communicate it so that it really represents something meaningful to the audience? Because that may be something very different and maybe something very different. So let's talk about a few techniques that the authors recommend, a few approaches. One is to use a perspective phrase. Uh, one of those phrases is something that I mentioned uh, earlier with the first example about the economy of the state of California. To use a, and that's also a category jumper because we're jumping from the economy of a state to the size of a country, we're jumping categories. But a perspective, um, say for example, um, around, um, Oh, let me give another example. The, um, if you were to say, how big is the, how big is Pakistan, for example, if somebody does a Google search, how big is Pakistan? The answer is Pakistan is 340,000 square miles. Okay, that's the statistic. A perspective phrase might be something like, that's about the size of two Californias. Now for me, at least as an American familiar with the US map, that is something translatable to me. I don't know what 340,000 square miles is compared to what? It's a little bit like when I heard about some of the forest fires earlier this year here in the state of New Mexico. They're talking about the millions of acres that have been burned. It sounds like a big amount, but I really can't quantify it. Tell me how big it is compared to another state or a city or something like that. And it gives me something to really understand it. It provides perspective. That'll be an example of using a perspective phrase. Also, Use vivid, meaningful messages, something that's meaningful um, to an audience. For example, here's the statistic. 97.5 of the world's water is salinated. That's only 2.5% that's fresh, right? And 99% of that 2.5% is trapped in glaciers and snow fields. And therefore only 0.025% of the water on the globe is actually drinkable by humans and animals. Well, that really sounds like a small amount to me. It does, 0.025% of, of the water is drinkable. But what if you communicate it this way? 
Imagine a gallon jug filled with water with three ice cubes next to it. So three ice cubes next to a gallon jug. All of the water in the jug is salt water. The ice cubes are the only fresh water and humans can only drink the drops that are melting off of the ice cubes. Whoa, that gives me something I can relate to. So again, a really interesting example of how do we, how do we convert something into something more vivid and meaningful. Another technique that the authors offer is localizing the message. And I do believe that marketing people understand this, good, effective communicators understand this. I didn't quite grasp it until I heard this, this example of how local health campaigns around the world communicated what uh, social distancing means for, uh, for COVID or something like that. And I know that the number that I heard most often is, or the, or the figure is, keep six feet of space, right? And sometimes, whether it's on subway platforms or, or in airports, they'd have these little footprints on the ground that would, that would mark it out for us. That's great. Then I don't have to think about what six feet. I just put my feet on the little things on the ground. That's helpful. But think about ways that these examples of how different um, health campaigns, presumably through governments or health agencies, localized this thing about six feet. In Canada, they talked about one hockey stick. Keep one hockey stick difference, uh, um, um, space. In Japan, they talked about one tatami mat. At the Ohio County Fair, they had a sign up that said, keep one alpaca apart. In France, they talked about keeping away two baguettes distance. Yes, I'm smiling as I think about this because I think it's really clever, but it's very relatable, right? If you're a kid who plays hockey and you're thinking, keep one hockey stick away, well, first of all, it's clearer to me. It's a little more memorable. Um, it also perhaps becomes a little bit more engaging and a little bit more personal and less clinical as to keeping uh, that type of a distance. So that would be one way to localize a message. Another approach is to convert abstract numbers into concrete objects. And the example that they provided here, I thought was really quite interesting. I'll read that. So let's say, for example, that you, God forbid, need to go to the doctor and the doctor needs to tell you the size of a tumor in your body. So what if your doctor tells you that your tumor is three centimeters? Okay, so a half an hour later, you may struggle to think, well, how, how big, what did, it, what did he say or what did she say? What did she tell me that was the size of this thing? I'm not sure, what's the number? And then, but, but what if alternatively, the doctor said that the tumor is the size of a grape? Or, right? Or so you, for example, the amount of meat recommended as part of a healthy meal is three to four ounces. Right. I've heard a number like this before, but what if I can what if it was communicated to me this way? The amount of meat recommended as part of a healthy meal is three to four ounces, which looks about the same size as a deck of cards. This is something I can keep in mind when I think about, you know, going for that second slab of barbecue. This, this is something that I can really visualize. It's a concrete object because it's so clear. It's going to be more memorable. So I'll remember grape if she tells me, God forbid, that there's a grape in there that shouldn't be there as compared to something that's a certain number of centimeters. So good example of a way to convert into concrete objects. And there's another example of converting something into a concrete object having to do with something broader or societal figure. For example, the concentration of wealth in the United States. So the statistic is the wealthiest 1% of Americans own 31% of the wealth in the country. The top 10% owns around 70% of the wealth and the bottom half, so half the US population owns around 2%. So to convert that to a concrete, concrete object would be, imagine an apartment building that has 10 units on each floor, 10 floors, 100 apartments in total. The richest 1% the richest, uh, owns 31 apartments in the building. Together, the 10 wealthiest, uh, the 10 wealthy, well, let me do it another way. The, yeah, I'm sorry, the richest person owns 31 apartments. Together, the 10 wealthiest own 70 of the apartments. The poorest person shares ownership with everyone who's worth less than $100,000. If that's you, 
then you and 49 other people would need to share two apartments. That's what you've got. So it's a way of, of a concrete object. That really makes the number sink in as opposed to some of these statistics about percentages. So another great example of converting an abstract number into a concrete example. Another strategy that they suggest, make the numbers personal. And this, this example is one that, that I can personally relate to because I remember it being shared with me when I uh, entered law school. If you've had this experience of entering law school, maybe you've heard this as well. So to be told the first year dropout rate is 33% in law schools. I don't need, I, and actually I wanna be careful. I don't know if that's still true. When I was in law school sometime close to the end of the last millennium, it was still a real number. It was communicated to me that way, but it was also communicated this way to our first year class sitting nervously in the first week of law school. Look to your left and look to your right. One of the three of you will not be here next fall. That gets our attention more than the statistic of 33%. These are people that I'm looking at, uh, many of them who we, of course, became good friends. So that makes it personal. Another strategy they suggest is to offer an encore. So give, give an example and then punctuate it even with something more. So let me share a very interesting example about the US diet and um, the impact on the environment. So a statistic about the amount of meat we consume in the United States might be useful for a public policy discussion around climate change or global warming. Um, that's was where a statistic like this comes from. If everyone in the world ate as much meat as Americans, the amount of land required to raise livestock would equal 138% of all of the habitable land on earth. Let's communicate it another way. If everyone in the world ate as much meat as Americans, all habitable land on earth would have to be used to raise livestock. And we'd still need more, an additional landmass as big as Africa and Australia combined. So there's a little oomph in using that, what they call an encore uh, in, in the example that's being shared. So then we're, we're comparing just the statistics to specific references to parts of the globe because we can, I think it's useful because we can visualize it. It comes to life that much more. And one final useful approach that I think is most important to identify, um, and then I have some more depending on the time we have left, is, is to show things that you can't put into words. And this is a particularly, um, I think, uh, poignant and, 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 and just interesting way of communicating numbers. And this has to do with the way one company demonstrated how their procurement system was overspending on a whole bunch of different duplicative products. So they were buying things from different places at different prices in a very efficient, inefficient way. So somebody came to a meeting uh, saying, we are wasting millions, perhaps tens of millions on an inefficient procurement system. And here's a nine tab spreadsheet that summarizes my findings. So just as all these numbers in there with these different prices, et cetera. Instead, what he decided to do is he came, he went to the meeting and said, I want to show you my collection of the 424 different gloves that our company is ordering now. And that represents just one minor product that we purchase. So he, he had an intern go down to pick up uh, exam, um, examples uh, or one of each glove. So you got the statistic, we're ordering 424. Get an example of each one, bring it back to my office, put it into a box. And the intern got all the gloves with the price tags attached to them and put the gloves in a box. And when, he, when this man presented it to the senior audience, he dumped them onto the table. And you could see the 424 different gloves on the table. Um, some of them were identical looking pairs of gloves. One was three dollars and something one was ten dollars and something and they're all spread on the table and you could see it and it's like this is what we're doing which and it led to it was, it was a physical demonstration that was much more visceral and real of course than some spreadsheet where you're just looking at different numbers that seem to be some are higher than the other but to look at this way appreciate it and they and that company they called it the glove shrine and they said people talked about the glove shrine for months 
and they thought, well, this is what's happening with respect to gloves. Where else are we spending in this way? You know, wildly inefficiently. You know, much much more interesting than talking about and memorable, and and useful and compelling than uh, I, we're wasting X amount of money. How do you see it? How do you bring it to life? So a physical demonstration like that is is also a really really useful, a really really useful tool. So those would be some useful examples. Um, I, I have some more approaches to share. I wonder if before I go to these additional approaches, we we bring Zach on uh, to see if what you have any thoughts about this or any discussion points before I bring in some more examples. I'm I'm curious uh, to see where you go with pie charts and stuff like that. I'm wondering if that's coming up. That was one one little note that I got because everyone loves a good pie chart. I feel like those are wonderful um uh, examples of numbers but these are great um i i mean i'm taking notes uh a, a lot of it just reminds me it's just storytelling you know just you know how do you, you how do you convert just a bunch of numbers to to telling a, a great story like you did with the um with the uh, uh the, the the earth you know with the day a day in the life of the earth right the history of the earth absolutely mm -hmm. yeah yeah it's amazing and, and i think go ahead no uh, please go ahead no no I, I and the encores i think are, are interesting too and to top it off you're going to need australia and uh and africa combined it's yeah it's really interesting I think it definitely relates to storytelling, and sometimes it is a story um, where you can, you know, picture yourself doing this, like the example of the, what does one in a million really mean? Go to the, you're going to the library, Harry Potter. You can visualize someone going to the library, um, or you can visualize yourself coming upon that jug of water with the three melting ice cubes. You know, could we could we see ourselves in this situation? Um, but understanding, just like just like with storytelling. Uh, you know your audience. What is your what does your audience want to hear? What are they used to? What what you know? What kind of stories do they prefer? And some of this is just as simple as knowing your audience. But some of these techniques about uh, just illustrating the impact of certain things, the disparities of wealth. Wait a minute. So half of us are crowded. Half of us in the country are crowded into two out of a hundred apartments. Yeah, that's that's how that works. Yeah, and I think that you know those visual images as well um you know you're talking about the grape you know to uh for the size of cancer or something like that i was thinking about this that there's a memorization technique do you know about this it's a it's it's it i don't know if i'll explain it exactly right but people who uh, are able to memorize like things very quickly they usually attach images to to yes yeah yeah mm -hmm. so if, they're, if they're going to the supermarket you know, and they need to remember what they're going need to buy at the supermarket. They'll uh, say, "I need bananas. Bananas in a basket." And so they'll they'll visualize the bananas and they'll put them in the basket. If I need, um, you know, a steak, you know, I think of a steak, and then I think of my grandmother who cooks great steaks. So I'm thinking I'm a grandmother with, this, you know, so then I think of the basket and my grandmother, and it's really just creating stories around it. So it's not just an abstract uh, list of things um, you you actually attaching meaning to them. So yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. And you know what, I think, I think what this book aims to do, and I think it does it well, is it shows us ways that I can do that converting for you. So mm -hmm. let me paint a picture of your grandmother well, that doesn't sound right, but let me paint a picture of something that would be memorable for you. So you don't have to do that equating with a memory exercise. I'll do it for you. Yeah. So say, for example, and let, let me share a few more points if I can, unless you have something else to contribute right now. No, great. Okay, cool. So a few other, a few other things like uh, the authors talk about using the rule of one. So finding one thing, one sample, one uh, prototype is another way of making statistic, statistics a little bit more, or perhaps a lot more memorable. So for example, here's the statistic that might be used uh, from uh, in a, a, a fast food, uh, actually, let me be more specific, hold on. So 
a company that manufactures uh, food or prepared foods has done a lot of research on who their typical customers are with the intention of figuring out, you know, who, who are they and how can we best reach them and how might we modify our packaging to, uh, to satisfy our typical customers. So the statistic is our median customer is 32 years old, married with kids. 93% of our customers work full-time. Our typical customer has an average of 1.7 kids with 1.3 under the age of five. So chances are there'll be more than one, a little bit more uh, than one child under the age of five. Her top three reasons for buying our product are convenience, familiar flavor, and it's, they're not as, our products are not as bad nutritionally as some of our competitors. That's what our server, survey data reflects to us. So it's painting a statistical picture. Let's think about, speaking of, let me paint a picture of a person. So here's the rule of one in the prototype uh, in bringing these statistics to life. A prototypical customer is a 32-year-old mom stopping by the store on her way home from work after picking up her kids from daycare. She's going down the aisle with a two-year-old in the cart and a four-year-old walking beside her. She has to grab the box she wants for dinner without the four-year-old unloading the shelf closest to him. And when she tries to read the ingredients and find print, the two-year-old is slapping the box out of her hand. So really getting, it's bringing this to life. After considering our prototypical customer, we recommend simplifying the package design so people can locate their favorite flavor faster and increasing the font size of our nutritional information. So it's focusing on the, the nutritional information, the, the flavor and the convenience, just as the statistics identified, but it's bringing it to life in such a greater way. By, by painting that type of a picture, that's what, that's what it can do. Um, I also want to point out the, there's a particular small chapter in the book that, that recommends user-friendly numbers. And what does it mean by user-friendly numbers? It means simpler is better. Round off numbers. Don't say something costs $3.88 million. Say it costs four. I mean, unless you're really dealing with something very specific, of course, uh, that it needs to be for a particular technical audience or whatever. But generally speaking, rounder, rounding numbers is better. And concrete is better uh, don't, rather than uh, decimals, fractions, or percentages. Concrete items, concrete numbers are better than portions. So what they recommend is if you have a really small number, it's like this tiny little thing, like the zero, like the 0 0.025% uh, of, of uh, the water on earth, it, then multiply it a number of times so that it, become, it can become a whole number. And they give some examples of that in the book, which I won't cite here. So um, firm numbers are good, whole numbers are good. And with that in mind, with rounding in mind and whole concrete numbers in mind, defer to expertise. So that rule one and rule two can be trumped by expert knowledge. If you're dealing with experts who are familiar with those statistics and the 0 0.025 means something to them that it wouldn't mean to another, it would not be as meaningful to another audience, use the specific statistic. And the example they gave was, you know, three, three uh, places to the right of the decimal point may seem like some really obscure, you know, 0 0.313, 0 0.278, maybe like, do we need to get into that level of detail? You're boring me. But if you're talking about batting averages, if you're an, an American baseball fan and you follow baseball and you understand that someone's hitting 323 versus 289, that means something to you. Don't round because those specific fractions um, um, mean something to you. So I think that's useful in terms of thinking about um, user-friendly numbers. What's user-friendly to the audience is particularly um, impactful, even if generally we wanna round our numbers and we wanna stay away from fractions. They also recommend expressing probability in terms of things that you can count. So it could be you're expressing probability like with the Harry Potter book where you're bringing something to life that way, going into the library, et cetera. What does one in a million mean? You could, you could use that, but also things you can count. So for example, if the statistic is a single M&M candy has four calories um, and a single Pringle potato chip has 10 calories, that's the wrong number, right? But how, how do you count, how does, how does this, how can I bring it more to life? 
with something I can count. For example, in order to burn off the calories in the single lemon amb, you'd have to walk two flights of stairs. And with respect to the Pringle, in order to burn off the calories in the single Pringle potato chip, you'd have to walk 176 yards or almost two football fields. This is something that I remember. So I may not want to hear the statistic if I'm marketing Pringles potato chips, but I probably ought to be aware of it. Another recommendation they have is use the clarity of common everyday items. Uh, so I would refer back to the example about the jug and the melting ice cubes, very common everyday items that I can relate to helps me understand the statistic a little bit more. They, they speak a bit in the book about Florence Nightingale, the British nurse who helped save many, 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 many lives after the working in hospitals in the Crimean War, mid 19th century. And how she used emotional numbers, emotional numbers, really, really useful. So if the comparison was, um, I'm sorry, the, the data size is that in the hospitals, they had 600 deaths for every 1,000 troops. So basically, they had a 60% death rate in British hospitals in the Crimean War. I may be slightly oversimplifying um, according to this book, so forgive me, but just if that's the working statistic, 60% deaths in the hospitals. What she said is, we had in the first seven months of the Crimean campaign, from disease alone, a rate, a rate of mortality which exceeds that of the Great Plague of London. So she's communicating this information back to legislators in the House of Commons, House of Lords in London. They had been very familiar with the Great Plague of London that happens just a, a, a short amount of time before that. So in other words, she's bringing it home with an emotional thing because we all know people who died in the Great Plague of London and she's converting something that happened way over there to something that, that maybe I can't relate to or I can't see, but she's relating it to something that we all lived through recently, an emotional number like that, really, really useful. And they also recommend establishing a pattern or crystallizing a pattern and then breaking it. So for example, Steve Jobs, um, Steve Jobs introduced the MacBook Air. I think they're talking about first generation MacBook Air. Actually, let me check the year for you because you may be wondering what, it, what example is this talking about? Yeah, the original MacBook Air is what this book is saying. And he first began talking about Sony's laptop, the TZ, which was a very, uh, a very thin laptop. And he talked to the, he talked to his audience and he said, it's a really, really good laptop. It's very thin, right? On its wider side, when closed, it's only 1.2 inches. And on the more narrow side, when closed, it's only 0.8 inches, less than an inch. So it's, it's a really good product. And, and that's really the market leader in terms of size. Now let's look at our product. He said, our product is, is 0.76 inches at its widest, uh, at its, at its uh, um, higher point when closed and only 0.16 inches when closed. So he set this pattern of, this is what a good laptop uh, a thinness, if you will, is by comparing it, by highlighting the competition, the Sony product, and then hitting you with, and this is where ours is. And then he showed a visual to the audience of how it compares. And then he came in with the kicker, which said, oh, and I want to point out something to you that the thickest part of the MacBook Air is still thinner than the thinnest part of the Sony laptop. So there's your encore, perhaps at the end in addition to a visual to help to help bring this uh, to life. The, the other example of a uh, establishing a pattern and then breaking it might be uh, this statistic about uh, free trade um, and the number of Americans, the percentage of Americans that favor free trade. So here's the statistic. 59% of Americans said that growing trade ties between countries is that growing these ties is very good or somewhat good. 
59%. And, but here's the way it was presented by this one journalist. Great majorities everywhere said that, actually the word is thumping majorities everywhere said that growing free trade ties between countries are very good or somewhat good. What, per, what are the percentages? 91% in China, 85% in Germany, 88% in Bulgaria, 87% in South Africa, 93% in Kenya. Of the 47 countries surveyed, the one that came in dead last was the United States at 59%. The only country within 10 percentage points of us was Egypt. So you set this pattern of 59%, that seems reasonably high, right? Then you compare it to pretty much everywhere else on earth, or at least the 47 countries that were surveyed. So you're establishing some sort of a norm or a pattern, and then you're breaking it through some additional information or through a comparison. So that, that I think is a good illustration of this, again, this last point of establishing a pattern or a reference and then breaking it. So, I mean, whatever the, the quantity is that you're highlighting, it stands out more when you, when you hold it up against the unspoken assumptions of the audience. What is the audience bringing to the, um, uh, to the table? And there's two other examples I'd share that I think are particularly um, it were particularly impactful for me, and you may read this book and some of the other statistics or, or communication of numbers may be more powerful for you. One of them harkens back to some research that was done a few years ago in the New York Times and elsewhere about um, how far our culture is from gender equity. And the statistic is that a very small percentage of Fortune 500 CEOs are women. I think the number is, is actually 3.8%. Um, but it doesn't list this here. I want to be careful. I'm pretty sure it was 3.8% at the time of this report. A very small percentage of Fortune 500 CEOs are women. Okay, I, I get it. I understand. I appreciate that. And um, how, would you, how about if you could communicate it this way, which would be statistically accurate. Among Fortune 500 CEOs, there are more of them named James than there are women. So if you went into a room and there were all five the CEOs of the Fortune 500 were in a room, there's 500 seats. And you said, how many are named James? More hands would go up than the number of women in the room. That's a perspective uh, phrase. And for me anyway, extremely impactful. And finally, the last example I'd share in terms of reframing data in ways that it could be useful and start a compelling conversation. And this is, this is what they would call, you know, building a model that you can work with or a reference that you can work with. For example, like the apartment building or something that you can work with and really grasp. When workers in an organization were polled only 37% said they have a clear understanding of what their organization is trying to achieve and why. Only one in five was enthusiastic about their team's goals and their organization's goals. And I hear numbers like this pretty, pretty regularly. Only one in five workers said they have a clear line of sight between their tasks and their teams and their organization's goals. Only 15% felt that their organization fully enables them to execute key goals only 20% fully trusted the organization they work for. I hear these numbers like, this is something to be concerned about, but what if you could translate it into something like this? Imagine if you were coaching 11 people on a soccer team. Only four of your players knew which goal they were aiming for. Only two of them cared about which goal was theirs. Only two players knew their position and how it related to the team overall. Only two players really trusted the coaches and team owners. Only two of them thought that they were given enough support to play their position as well as they knew they could. Most of your players, players would then likely be aimlessly kicking a ball around the field. I think it's, this is a great example of making statistical data more visceral, more understandable. It shows the impact of the data. I mean, yes, it, it, could this potentially be used for manipulation or otherwise? Absolutely, it could. And it's a way of turning numbers into a position or into a, a conversation starter, as I see it. Um, ultimately, the book's about increasing 
our impact in communicating important numbers and starting a conversation um, or, or advocating for a particular course of action. So in terms of conclusions in the book, I'd say there's, there's a few. Uh, this is my opinion as to what's most important conclusions. Numbers have a place in our work. They just do, they're going to, they should. And we will all be more successful if we can translate the numbers so people can understand them better and engage with them. Like, what does this mean for me uh, as, 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 as somebody in this company? Just like, what does it mean for me as somebody in this culture to hear some statistic about health or, or the environment or something like that? And finally, this is a real key theme throughout the book, communicating numbers with emotion is a powerful tool for influencing people to pay attention to the right things. So using emotion, and that's typically through examples that bring to life um, some of these numbers and what they mean for each of us. So those that I think those are the most important points of this book. I would definitely recommend it. And I think it's a great conversation starter for, for us uh, in the world of executive coaching and leadership development in culture change. What should we be paying attention to? Um, how do we start those conversations? Just in the last few weeks, as I've been preparing for this, I've been speaking with several clients who want to influence their uh, impact in meetings at certain, uh, with certain audiences, et cetera. And among the things we're talking about are, well, what are the numbers you want to communicate? How could you bring it, you bring it to life for your audience? And this book is full of really rich, useful examples for that, for how to do that. And it's a good read and a quick read. I'd recommend it. Thanks for listening. Zach, any thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I feel like, uh, especially in this, uh, you know, what we're doing right now, a virtual, um, uh, you know, in a Zoom space and stuff, to just engage with people more by using using these examples, using these stories, um, you know, they to hear a lot of numbers just kind of being spoken, even in in even in your last or one of your last examples about the team, you know, uh, the those when when you get twenty percent, thirty percent, fifteen, and you just keep I'm I'm just trying to keep up, but then when you talk right. about the you know the mess that's going to be going on on the soccer field, absolutely, you know, it's it's clear. Okay, yeah, the, the, and we're not in the same. Uh, I, I can I can see what the impact of those numbers me mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. the real impact of them so yeah super important and and like i said i think more important now when you know you're not face to face with people and and you are really trying to um to give them good visuals um when you have limited limited resources uh well i mean well yeah it's, some would say in zoom you've got all the resources you can show videos you can Dude. Well, yeah, but you know what? I, let me just forgive me for butting in here for one second Please. here. But, you know, I was speaking with a client earlier today on the other side of the world, actually, um, this afternoon for me in the morning, his time. And he was talking about eye contact as a way of influencing in meetings. And you can only do so much for eye contact when you're on Zoom. Yeah. Because let's say, for example, if I were an excellent presenter, as I aspire to be, I could be looking at that green dot just w unflinchingly and moving its head. I can't control what somebody on the other side who's in their kitchen working from home or whatever is doing. If they're looking at me, what their view is, if they're walking away or even if, but even if they're tuning in and watching, it's not the same as the physical experience and the sensory experience of having eye contact. I mean, as, as, as my experiences, and I think this is a scientifically proven fact, you can feel somebody looking at you when they're behind you. Like we're wired to do that. That don't happen on Zoom. Yeah. Nobody knows which box I'm looking in when I'm looking on Zoom. I don't have a feeling that someone, somebody's looking at me. It's, we just, we lose that dimension. So to that extent, I, I think, I'm not saying the numbers, you know, communicating numbers effectively can make up for that. But I think it's, it's, it is a way because we're, we're doing this verbally and sometimes with visuals, we're doing this verbally and it is a way of engaging people. Maybe it comes back to your storytelling. Yeah, I can still I tell a compelling this, story via Zoom. Even yeah, via absolutely. Zoom, I can tell a compelling story. Absolutely. Or on the podcast, et cetera. 
Uh, I've, I've been watching recently um, some clips from a movie that I think is really good um, at talking about numbers and and dramatizing it uh, to some extent um, is Moneyball. I don't know if you mm -hmm. have you seen that. I don't. It's on my list, but it's 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 precisely because I want I want them to translate what some of these what some of these processes are into uh, language I can understand. But please share more. Well, no, it's just interesting, you know, they, they are, cru the, the crux of it, um, and I haven't watched the whole movie, I was just watching some clips, is they, they're realizing that, you know, sometimes the player, what it's about by, it, you know, they're basically giving these guys it's, sound. It's about measure, measuring the right things. I have seen it. The one I thought that you were talking about was, it, it's on my list, is the big short, where they're really explaining about the financial crisis, things like that. But yeah, so with Moneyball, it's like, what are we valuing with respect to players? Yeah. Are we paying attention to the right things? Am I getting that right? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. But the Big Short is is good good with that too. The Big the, uh, the Big Short actually maybe is more to the point of of this. The Big Short does have uh, okay. Let's explain it in a hot tub with Margot Robbie, and maybe you'll understand what credit default right. swaps mean if we give you something really interesting. Um, I yeah, I, f I found the Big Short to be a really fun uh, movie about all that about the, the that financial crisis as well but, but what was it what was it about moneyball that that this brings forward for you well um you know I was just w w watching a, a scene about like what are we, what are we looking at we're just mm -hmm. looking at how many times he gets on base and that's mm -hmm. the, the this one scene that you can find a clip of it um it and they just keep saying how many times does he get on base and that and and you just realize, oh, okay, that's what we're looking for. We don't care how he gets on base. We don't care mm -hmm. if he can't hit. We don't care if he can't run. We don't care, uh, you know, mm -hmm. um, you know how old he is. How does he get on? How many times has he gotten on base? That's the mm -hmm. measurement that we're, you know, mm -hmm. staring in on. Because if we can get a bunch of guys that can do that, then the guy that can really hit, he's going to really get us the points that we want. You know, mm -hmm. that's the important right. thing, not right. know, how many guys can really hit, but if they can't really get on base, then it, it doesn't matter. You know, this is right. So if we're, if we're overemphasizing what somebody's batting average is, you know, how many times they get clean hits or something. So their batting average is this hallowed number that we tend to overemphasize as yeah. compared to how many times do they walk? How many times do they get hit by a pitch? How many times, you know, whatever um that that matters in terms of scoring runs and scoring runs is about winning games exactly yeah yeah so i thought that was yeah. just interesting in that scene and at, at yeah. the end i know nothing about baseball i don't i you could tell me a, a batting average you tell me two and i wouldn't i mean i'd say the higher one's probably better but i wouldn't know right, if, right. if either's are good but but that i was watching that scene and i was like ah because they kept saying he gets on base that's the, <laughs> yeah that that's what we need to know yeah mm -hmm. so anyway um yeah, uh, very cool, very cool book. Thank you. Uh, cool. Yeah. So, so yeah. The, so the encouragement here is look for ways that this book can help us bring numbers to life. Especially if we, I think, if we find ourselves, I think we all do at times. Like, okay, I've got this number. Like, what do I do with it? How do I communicate it? Um, how do I help this audience and, and to really feel it and put it on and you know walk around in it. Um, and that's, and I think we're all doing that at some, at some important points and it helps our decisions, whether it's, you know, how much do I want to borrow some money? And if so, how much, and what does it represent either compared to something else or compared to my overall spending or something like that? There's just, and, and I, I can envision teams and I've spoken with some leaders about this already. I can envision teams, uh, you know, sitting around talking about a statistic that's important for them saying, how else can we describe this? Or how else can we represent this number in terms of the opportunity cost? What else could we be doing with this investment? Or what else could we be doing with the time it's going to take to accomplish this? Now that we've calculated how much time it's going to take, we could say, well, here are the other things we could be doing. And then going back to some key customer and saying, what would you prefer that we do? Um, but you just translating the numbers into something that's that's meaningful. It's, uh, it is a superpower, I think, if we can do it well. Yeah.